In the West, we have instead theism or creationism, which flows from one of the most radical ideas in the history of human thought, namely the idea that never once occurred to any human mind in all of the history of the world except to a Jew or those who learned it from the Jews. Creation. There are no creation myths. The myths do not believe in creation. The myths believe in some gradual formation or evolution or uh, uh, making by the gods or a god of a world out of something that came before. But the idea that a single god created everything that exists out of nothing whatsoever was an idea so radical that when some of the first Jewish philosophers like Philo uh, talked to the Greek philosophers, they thought he was insane. He had never heard an idea like that before. It has since become very familiar to Christians and Muslims uh, because we inherit this Jewish revelation. But the idea of a totally transcendent God who is other than the universe and created it out of nothing gives you a dualistic world picture. There are two things. There's a creator and a creature. So from that point of view, pantheism is hopelessly out of date. Once there was nothing but God, but God created so, you know, catch up with the newest pantheist, you're 18 billion years behind the times. Connected with this idea of a transcendent God, there is also the idea that God has a will, a moral will, and is not present in evil, but only in good. To the pantheist, God is present in everything, evil as well as good, and is morally indifferent. Assuming that we make the choice for theism, that is, the God of Abraham, who created the world and who has a moral will, assuming we connect to the two deepest instincts of our own heart, namely the religious and the moral, the instinct to worship something and the instinct we call conscience, assuming that we follow this Jewish lead, which was not theirs but God's revelation to them, the next question is then, do we also follow the Jewish revelation historically? Has this God appeared in history, or is he, as the deists say, an absentee landlord? He created the world and then did nothing else in it. If we follow this Jewish revelation, then we have another road than simply abstract reason. We have the road of history to look for clues about what God has done in history. And then the seventh choice is the most shattering historical event on this trail of all, namely the man who said he's God, Jesus Christ. The choice here is between Christianity and Judaism or Islam or Unitarianism. That is, is God only one person or is he three? The doctrine of the Trinity and the doctrine of the Incarnation, which imply each other, separates Christianity from all other religions and all other philosophies, because every Christian believes this, and no non-Christian did. Uh, it does. If they did, they'd be Christians. Finally, if accepting this claim of Christ to be God incarnate, you are a Christian, then the fundamental choice is, what about the claim of the Catholic Church to be the Church Christ founded? Is this true, or is it not? Catholics say yes, others protest it and say no. So, there are the alternatives. Let's just concentrate on the last choice, Protestant versus Catholic. The second reason I have why everyone should be a Catholic is the basic reason that I found, the one thing that more than anything else decided me. And it's very closely connected with the path trod by Cardinal Newman. History. At Calvin College, I was falling in love with things Catholic, and I had been taught that this was wicked, that the church was the whore of Babylon, so that I was going into a temptation, so I wanted to get some ammunition against this temptation. So I enrolled in a good, solid church history course by a good, solid, intelligent, honest Calvinist professor. And the first day, right at the beginning, he said, not knowing who I was from Adam or that I was tempted to things Catholic, he said, someday you're going to meet a Roman Catholic, and they're going to say to you, you're in the wrong church because our church was founded by Jesus Christ and it's 2,000 years old and your church is only founded by John Calvin and it's only 450 years old. What do you say to that? And I said, I say, thank you, God, you put me in the right course. Uh, and then he said, 
he said, we Calvinists have better had a defense against the Catholics. What is our philosophy of church history? Nobody had an answer. He said, well, here's what the Catholics will say. They'll say, Jesus Christ planted a little seed called the Catholic Church, and it was one, and it put up many branches, and it's now almost 2,000 years old. But some 500 years ago, some people named Luther and Calvin uh, broke off some branches and tried to plant it separately. What do you say to that? Nobody had an answer. Uh, he said, well, here's what we say. Here's your answer. Jesus Christ created a church, uh, and it's described in the New Testament, and it was a very simple church, to put it crudely. It was a Protestant church, not a Catholic church. But it was like Noah's Ark, and it sailed around for 1,500 years, and by that time it had gotten a lot of barnacles on its hull. So what Luther and Calvin tried to do was scrape the barnacles off. They didn't make something new. They tried to restore something old. He said, those Catholics misunderstand what the Reformers tried to do. They think that we were progressives. We're not. We're the traditionalists. We wanted to return the church to its pristine, pure New Testament essence. So they think the Reformation was branch breaking, and we think it was barnacle scraping. I said, but gee, that makes it very clear. So I asked a question. I said, Professor, if I took a time machine and went back 1900 years to the early church, like around 100, you're saying to me that I would find it that it was a Protestant church. And if a Catholic and I both took the same time machine, I'd feel more at home there than he would. He said, exactly. I said, okay, thank you. And then I said, great. Now I can find out for myself that this is true. All I'll have to do is read the church fathers and find out how Protestant they were and convince myself that I'm in the right church. Well, I think you know the rest of the story. <laughs> but I was thrilled that this was an empirical issue, not just a theological, abstract, philosophical, argumentative issue. This was an issue of facts. I was always impressed by the fact that Christianity, of all the religions of the world, is the most easy to disprove. If the bones of the dead Jesus would only turn up in some tomb in Palestine, all Christianity would be destroyed. Uh, we have so many historical claims that if any one of those claims about what really happened in history could be disproved by archaeology, let's say, we'd be dead in the water. It never, ever happened. Science relates to Christianity much more than to any other religion, certainly much more than to, to Eastern religions. But there has never been what a lot of people think there has been, namely, a real contradiction between science and religion. It's never happened. There's not a single discovery of any of the physical sciences that has ever refuted a single doctrine of the Christian religion. Could have happened, didn't. So I said, wow, the Catholic issue is the same thing. It's something I can find out by just looking at the facts. So I read the Church Fathers, and I found that, for instance, from the beginning, there was this primacy of the Bishop of Rome, and that there was this absolute authority of a single worldwide church, and I found that the Eucharist and not preaching the sermon was the center of Christian worship from the very beginning, and that uh, uh, the real literal presence of Christ in the Eucharist was taken for granted and strongly affirmed by every single Christian in all of history until Luther. I said, uh-oh. So there's my second reason. And the simplest reason for being a Catholic. I am a Catholic because I'm a Christian. Uh, Christ is my Lord, and I want to follow his lead. If he established the Catholic Church, that's why I want to be in it. So I'm in it. Third reason. C.S. Lewis, who is, I think, the best Christian apologist of the 20th century, uh, is famous for an argument which I think is his best and most important argument. It's influenced a lot of Protestant apologists like Josh McDowell who call it the Lord, liar, or lunatic argument. Lewis got it from the church fathers who call it in Latin out deus out homo malus, which means either God or a bad man. The argument proves the divinity of Christ, the distinctively Christian doctrine, the doctrine it's at the center of Christianity, the doctrine that all Christians believe and no non-Christians do. The doctrine that is probably the single doctrine of the very earliest Christian creed, mentioned a few times by Paul, namely, Jesus is Lord. 
the divine title. Uh, the argument is.